Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Shima. I'm a librarian here at the San Francisco Public Library. And bef before we begin our program for today, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm in San Francisco, California, on the unceded land of the Remetush Ohlone people. To learn more about the land you are on, please visit the link in the chat. As you may know, Summer Stride is the library's annual summer learning program. It looks a little bit different this year, but it's definitely in full swing. Today's program is part of our BIPOC Kid Lit series, and it wouldn't be possible without the friends of the San Francisco Public Library. So many, many thanks to our friends. I asked today's wonderful author to participate in this program series because the book, Oasis in the World's Famous Hispanic, makes seamless use of multiple languages, which mirrors the experience of so many of our bilingual families in San Francisco today. Just so you know, during today's program, you'll have a chance to ask our presenter questions. Just put them in the Q&A box if you're on Zoom or in the chat if you're watching via YouTube. And speaking of today's presenter, I'm delighted to introduce the author of Oasis in the World's Famous Hispanic. Dallas Hunt. Dallas is Cree and a member of the Wapsosipi Swan River First Nation in Treaty 8 territory in Northern Alberta, Canada. He has had creative works published in Contemporary Verse 2, Prairie Fire, Prism International, and Arc Poetry. His first children's book was Oasis in the World Famous Bannock, published through Highwater Press and nominated for several awards. His new book, Creeland, is out now through Nightwood Editions. Dallas is an assistant professor of Indigenous Literatures at the University of British Columbia. Welcome, Dallas. Tansini to Temtak, Dallas Hunt and Tukasan, Nia Omeneheo, Egwa Wapsusipil, Otunia. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dallas Hunt, and uh, as uh, was just uh, said in the bio, uh, I'm Cree and a member of Swan River First Nation in Treaty Territory in uh, Northern Alberta, Canada. So uh, I'm happy to be in San Francisco right now. Um, I wish I was literally in San Francisco <laughs> right now, but uh, you know, uh, Canada will do. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, so delighted to be here. We're so excited to have you. So Dallas, I know that normally when you do this kind of program, you have a coloring exercise that you would do. Yeah. So it, um, you would hand out black and white versions of the color cover. Yeah, so, so there are, are like various versions of Oasis in the world famous Bannock, uh, uh, but one of uh, them is uh, sort of black and white where you can actually, um, uh, sometimes when I go do readings, I'll bring some of these black and white uh, uh, printouts with me and, uh, and uh, people will color them and it's, it's a lot of fun. So, so uh, actually, I, I think we can do that virtually today. Um, so I'm going to share a black and white cover. Can everybody see Oasis? And um, ask our, maybe ask our audience for suggestions on how to color this in a little bit. Um, do we have any suggestions from our audience for what color should Oasis's hair be? Does anybody want to chime in? Let's see. I personally used to have green hair, so maybe I'll color Oasis's hair a green. That's what I'll do. And then um, in Spanish, the word for green is verde. Is What's the word for green in Cree, Dallas? Oh, uh, that's actually a good question. Uh, <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> So it's a verb, and but we can get into that uh, maybe in the. Um, it depends whether or not the thing that you're talking about is animate or inanimate. And so if it's uh, sometimes, yeah, the way. So in uh, Cree, 
uh, sometimes the way we conjugate verbs is whether or not the noun we're talking about is inanimate or animate. So one way I explain this to people is, um, you know, if we were to say uh, something like pig, you know, in Cree, it'd be cocos, which is an animate. But uh, if you were to say bacon in Cree, it would be inanimate. So that's how we sort of, that's how we conjugate our verbs. And that colors in Cree are our verbs, so. That's so interesting and um, not, I think, not entirely unique necessarily because in Spanish, we there's a different word for fish if you're eating it or if it's in the ocean, which makes sense because it's experiencing the world pretty differently, right? Um, 100%. Is hair considered animate or inanimate? Well, I think my hair is, uh, my hair is animate. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually don't know. That is a great question. Um, okay, well, let's, let's keep that in mind. And um, I got a suggestion for an orange bunny. So I'm gonna color that, Oop. I'm gonna color that in orange and a bunny is definitely animate, right? 100%, yeah. So that would be Wapos and that would be the uh, bunny. Okay, awesome. Um, should we do one more? Can we get one more suggestion maybe? Let's do, I remember that a purple duck, amazing. Thank you so much, Lisa. Let's do purple. Duck purple. Amazing. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool duck. Um, and the duck is named. We meet him in Oasis, and or them, and yeah. So uh, that is CC. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna stop sharing, and then Dallas, you're gonna share your screen. Sure. We'll continue with the presentation. Thanks everybody for your color suggestions. Okay, so let me share my screen. Can I, so can y'all see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of give a just general uh, kind of brief talk about this book that I um, wrote and that my friend Amanda Strong uh, illustrated. Uh, Amanda Strong is a uh, filmmaker, a, um, a uh, uh, illustrator, just, just a fantastic um, uh, artist, generally speaking. And I'm sorry that they couldn't be here today, uh, but uh, um, you know, every time I talk about this book, I get to bring up Amanda and their wonderful work. And so I do that uh, sort of as much uh, as possible. So I thought what I might do today is just sort of give a little bit of the sort of context uh, in, in terms of how this book came to be a book, because I think sometimes people are interested in, you know, process and stuff like that. So uh, this is Oasis in the World Famous Hispanic. We've already done the coloring aspect. So there it is, black and white. But I wanted to talk a bit more about how so you see Oasis on the right here, and I kind of wanted to talk a bit about the evolution of Oasis as both a book, but also as a character. So one thing I wanted to just sort of foreground here is that actually when I started um, writing the book, oh, sorry, uh, its original title was uh, A Boy and His Bannock. And so you see here, you have uh, Oho, you have Wapos, Sisi, and Aegis, the frog on the right there. Uh, that was going to be the original title of the book. And I just like the sort of alliteration, you know, and things like that. And so that's uh, why um, it was sort of configured that way. But then when I talked to my publishers, um, I was sort of making some of the characters in the book just sort of gender neutral and things like that. And they sort of said, well, why does a wasis have to be, you know, a boy? Uh, and, you know, what can we, we just had a long sort of, um, but very generative uh, sort of talk through about how um, this children's book would come to, 
to be really and how we would sort of think about not only the main character Oasis but all the other little uh, animals or kin that Oasis meets on the way. So this was actually the uh, original cover of Oasis in the World Famous Hispanic and it was um, something that I um, and this is something that happens in publishing, I think, or when you work with other people, you, um, um, that was not the sort of idea I had for Oasis. And so uh, when I talked to the illustrator, Amanda, uh, I said, so they had already done a book called Spirit Bear with somebody named Cindy Blackstock, who's uh, uh, in, uh, here in Canada, does a lot of great work with Indigenous children and uh, is, a, is a strong advocate for Indigenous children, generally speaking. Um, and so I said, I kind of wanted the sort of whimsical element of Spirit Bear. And so um, we started off with that image and it didn't uh, particularly jive with me. And, um, and I think Amanda too was just trying to get uh, a feel for things. And uh, so what happened next, uh, just in terms of process, is we started to think through what Oasis would look like. And so uh, at one point, Oasis looked like this. So this is when Oasis was still a boy and Hispanic, and we were trying to think through different titles and think through what Oasis would look like. And it's really invigorating or just really uh, interesting, I guess, to um, yeah, to write something on the page and then see somebody try to like create it as an illustration, right? And so this is Oasis as uh, a young boy and uh, this would have been a boy in Hispanic. Uh, it still didn't really sit uh, completely right with me. And I think Amanda too was like, nah, I don't think that's actually Oasis. So then we tried this. Also, I think would have been very cute. and <laughs> would have been, you know, a great, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, hopefully these, you know, characters will make their way into subsequent books or something, but uh, that too didn't feel like a wasis to me. And so uh, after a while, um, after several emails back and forth between uh, Amanda and I, um, we eventually came up with this and that's a wasis. So this is Oasis from Oasis in the World Famous Hispanic. And aside from the very cute gray sweater, uh, I think the only change here is that Oasis actually wears suspenders in the children's book. Um, and uh, so that's how we ended up here. But um, it really was a sort of collaborative process which took, you know, um, back and forth emails that were very generative and very like just exciting and um, um, yeah and we eventually arrived at this character for Oasis and then when we were going through the animals we started to talk about things like colors and stuff like that so uh, when we were doing the coloring at the beginning it's kind of funny because yeah I think that um, yeah we uh, I like how the bunny is blue in the book and uh, in all of these things, but um, I also like seeing all of these different characters as, as all of these sort of different colors and stuff like that. And so uh, generally that's how I wrote the book. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to give you all a sort, of, a, a sort of little, a little bit of insight into, and even though I'm doing this in a sort of abridged amount of time, like a short amount of time, uh, this took about a year and a half. So we went through a different title. We went through a completely different design. We overhauled everything. Uh, Oasis took many different shapes. And then we eventually ended up with this, uh, yeah, the cute little uh, person you see in your right there. So. Um, that's really all I wanted to say about Oasis, but I'm happy to answer any questions or talk more about the book. Um, but that was the most sort of uh, enlightening part to me was actually going through the collaborative process of uh, being someone who is a terrible drawer and trying to uh, have a children's book. And so, yeah, you have to work with other people. And I think working with other people is you know, incredibly important. And, you know, yeah, no, definitely. And it's, um, it's 
good to know, like creativity is an iterative process, right? Like you had the idea and then you were like, wow, this is not what I had in mind. How can I explain this to somebody else? Which is always difficult too, right? Um, so it's, it's interesting that it was a conversation and that it took so long. Um, so I have a couple questions. I have some questions and we have some questions from the chat. Um, should I stop sharing or should I just leave this no, up? No, if you, you could keep it up, that would be great. So the right. first question is, what was the first illustration of Owasis? So yeah. was so the, the, first, the first... So the first illustration of Owasis was this one, sorry, right here. Okay. So, yeah. And I mean, you can kind of actually see the beginnings of the book kind of manifesting here. You see the bear behind the tree, you see the bridge, yeah. you see all the cute little animals and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I don't know, I personally thought this like version of Oasis was kind of like a skater boy. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm getting that vibe too, for sure. Like, yeah, like he was about to shred the gnar and I <laughs> kind of was not so much into that. And so I, I, that's why I sort of suggested the more sort of whimsical kind of drawing. And so that's when you, so uh, a boy in Hispanic, which you see above it here was the original title. And right. um, we, yeah, that it, it's kind of misplaced in a way because um, yeah, well, maybe I'm misremembering. It was remembering sort things. of flipped. Yeah, yeah, in, in a way. Yeah. So we, we, we got the illustrations down first, and then we started to think about the title and things the like title. that. And so that's, yeah. And so this is when you see Oasis look a bit different, and then a bit different. And then when you have Oasis on the right here, uh, or at least my right, um, which I thought was, uh, it was one of those weird things where you see something and you're kind of like, oh, like, that's it. That's what I was looking yeah. for. Yeah. Um, when it was boy and Hispanic, was the child always referred to as boy or did boy have a name? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but Owasis means child, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so Owasis uh, in Cree generally is gender neutral. Um, and um, yeah, Cree's an uh, interesting language, but uh, in this instance, yeah, it, uh, um, like there are terms for boy and girl uh, in um, and woman and man and all these things in Cree. And, uh, but I had always had the intention of having a sort of character that was just sort of, uh, yeah, kind of gender neutral. And so I was, I was happy when uh, Amanda came back to me with this sort of illustration. And I, I only liked a boy in Hispanic because of the alliteration. But when my publisher was like, I actually am not sold on that. Like it's, uh, I don't think it's that great of a title. I was like, oh, okay. I like fair okay. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one thing that I learned throughout this process is um, to really trust or to have the ability to trust editors. Um, so I'm also an academic by training. I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia and uh, generally academics, you know, there, there can be a push and pull with editors, but with this children's book, um, the, the editors were suggesting things to me that I would have never thought of, like ever. And so just because I don't think in a sort of, uh, well, I, I think now I do after the book, but when I was first writing it, uh, I didn't think in a uh, sort of visual register in the way that the, in, in, in the way that the editors sort of pushed me towards. And so it was, um, is really enlightening. It was, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually um, circles into one of the questions that we have from the chat, because you are an academic. What was the inspiration for making a picture story? So um, I was driving with a friend and we were going from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia and Canada over to uh, this uh, city called Edmonton, Alberta. Y'all are in San Francisco, so you're not going to remember any of this. Anyway, we were driving a vast distance. Um, and uh, we were in this area where it said Bannock for sale. It was like a big pink sign with like black writing, kind of how a boy in his Bannock is written there. And uh, 
we really wanted some of this bannock. And so we kept trying to get it. We kept trying to like find this bannock. And it felt like every time we got within uh, a mile or two of it, um, we would see another sign that said it was 10 miles away. So we were like, you know, where the hell is this bannock? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> and so uh, as I was driving with this friend, we were just sort of like, uh, we didn't actually end up getting the bannock, which is the saddest part about this whole story. But we um, eventually, um, yeah, we just started to, I was like, oh, wouldn't that be like an interesting like adventure story if you got to like, you know, kind of walk around and look for bannock and all of these things. And so that was kind of the inspiration was a literal, you know, road trip, trying to find bannock, didn't find <laughs> it. And so in the book, that's Awasis finds the bannock. So um Owasis in many ways succeeded when you know where where I failed <laughs> <laughs> um that's that's awesome but why what was the jump between saying hey this is a story that I could share with somebody I know who already works in children's literature as opposed mm. to completely changing your relationship with editors essentially because as you said, in academia, the relationship is quite different between the editor and the author. So what was the extra, what caused yeah, you to make no. that extra jump? I think that's a great question. I think more or less what happened was, um, so uh, I, I have a close friend who's also a children's uh, book uh, or author, uh, writes children, uh, children's books. Uh, their name is uh, Julie Flett. And so uh, they have a book called Birdsong, which is uh, incredible, and um, they have a book on Cree numbers and all of these things, and they're this incredible illustrator, and actually the person who I uh, originally was going to do this book with, um, but uh, so I remember just telling this story to my friend Julie, uh, we were having tea one day, and um, once I told her the story, she said, I think that's a children's book, like, and I was like, yeah, I was kind of thinking of it as a children's book. And so we talked about it more and more. And again, um, I would, uh, to people who might not be familiar with Julie Flett's work, I would really search her out. Um, uh, her work is uh, incredible and she's constantly producing new work. And um, so we sort of talked about the idea and, um, but then I think Julie just, because Julie is an artist and is constantly like working on things, they had to go do other projects. And so they recommended uh, Amanda to me. And um, so uh, that's sort of what happened at uh, sort of on that end, just the general getting, uh, getting introduced into the sort of publication or the children's book publishing industry. And uh, so um, Julie was critical there um, and does a lot of great work with a lot of other Indigenous authors, uh, um, Indigenous to uh, what's currently called Canada. And then, um, yeah, in terms of working with the editors, uh, Julie pitched Highwater Press to me, and I was incredibly uh, grateful to work with them. And, and the way the sort of editing process worked was I was like, okay, you know, Oasis does this, goes over there and talks to you know, this animal and stuff like that happens. Like it made a sort of rational sense to me in my head and all these things. And then I remember the first time I sort of started to realize that things could look and just be sort of projected or cast differently was when, well, you say a wasp this yells here. So why don't we make the text big and in all caps? And I was like, I would have never thought of that. Like it, which seems on the face of it, like is something very simple, but um, I think it's just years of being uh, publishing children's books where the editor was like, okay, when Oasis whispers, we're gonna make the writing really, really small. And I was like, that's brilliant. I would have never thought of that, but it, it makes sense. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think so again, you circled right into one of the questions because one of the questions was, can you give an example of one of these surprising suggestions from an editor? But I could see yeah. also how that would be enervating because when you're making a really strong point in an academic article, you don't get to put it in all caps and underlines. Like I swear. I mean, I wish I could. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there well, another uh, example like that maybe? 
Yeah, so uh, text in children's books, I, I realized you can really, it's very malleable, so you can actually play around with it, which I was like, oh, okay, this is super um, uh, invigorating, and I, I like this idea. I had this idea of having the bear show up at the end, so Mask was the bear, and is there at the beginning. Uh, I mean, spoiler alert, if you haven't read the book, it's it's like 11 pages, so you can read it pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I thought about having the bear at the beginning and the end and maybe somewhere in the middle. And then the, the publishers uh, said, well, why don't we have the bear basically on uh, almost on every page? So um, if you read the book, you'll see the bear almost on every page. And that too, I was sort of like, yeah, that would be fun, like super fun for, you know, for little ones like looking for stuff. and. But again, it's not something that uh, as somebody who writes in different registers at time, like at, at times, uh, not something that I would have thought of. But uh, yeah, those um, editors are really, uh, really great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, we actually, everybody next week, if you want to tune into SFPL's Facebook Live, uh, Dallas helped me read Oasis in... So we did a trilingual reading in English, Cree, and Spanish, and it was really cool to see Mascua the Bear on every single page, and it's a cool sort of undermining of expectations, because it almost looks like the bear might become ominous, especially at the end, uh, and then it's, it just up, ends up being the most helpful, <laughs> so that's yeah. kind of cool, too. I mean, um, all that said, if you do see a bear, you should uh, do not invite it into your house. But uh, yeah, aside from that, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of like Masqua sort of introduction uh, or how Masqua sort of bookends the book. Like that, that was sort of how I envisioned it. So, but yeah, if you want to hear it in Cree, Spanish, and English, I would definitely check out that video. So, so. You said that you were mentioning some places in Canada and you said, oh, you're in San Francisco. You probably don't know where they are, but we have a commenter who said Ooh. they have a cousin in Edmonton. And a cousin in Edmonton, wow. Well, yeah, I'm so related hello. to them. Yeah. <laughs> and then also someone else from YouTube said, hello from Bernadette and Maria in Ohio. So there's people who might know these places in Canada. Um, Big shout I out also, to uh, Ohio for me. <laughs> okay. Hi, Ohio. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, and I have a couple more questions, um, kind of a little bit linked. Um, the book is in Cree, and Oasis's name is Cree, but did you intend Oasis to represent Cree childhood or a certain kind of Cree childhood? Was were you thinking about that when you were talking about your illustrations and um, the way you characterize them? I mean, for instance, I'm from Southern California where it does not snow, but I noticed that in the this picture on the right, um, it looks like Oasis is wearing boots. And then the picture on the left, it looks like they're wearing loafers. And I thought like, oh, of course they would be wearing boots in one of the first illustrations because it's snows and gets cold there right so like what, I mean what were you trying to explicitly represent a certain kind of childhood or personhood yeah I think that's uh yeah that's a great question I wasn't particularly trying to um present a form of Cree childhood uh I mean um um all, but I mean, that said, uh, uh, some of the guiding sort of principles behind the book, um, I think are very uh, uh, critical or crucial to Cree ways of being in the world kind of thing. So we have this concept called uh, Wakotawin, which is uh, basically being in relation to others, but it's, some people just define it as kinship, but my my understanding of Wakotawin is that it's, it's actually, it's, it's something you do, it's, it's it, it's iterative. It's it's a verb. It's something you're constantly enacting, right? And so it shifts. It modulates. It does all these things. And so um, when I thought about the book and what it would look like, I basically thought, um, yeah, that um, 
I wanted this sort of kind of adventure story in the woods kind of thing, but I also wanted these sort of notions of sort of reciprocity, of sharing, of, of, of kindness to sort of be there in the foreground. And so while uh, I don't think it's in any way a sort of definitive representation or, uh, you know, of what being a Cree child is like or any of these things, uh, I, I wanted to get a few sort of uh, concepts in there where it's, um, like you said, Masqua isn't this sort of, uh, you know, ominous character, rather it's it's somebody who, in the grand scheme of all these things, helps in their own particular way, right? And so that's sort of how I, and I think that's how we should think of our other than human kin, uh, in terms of Aegis, the frog, or whether it's Seasip, the duck, it's, um, they're all doing, they make this ecosystem sort of live and, you know, flourish and if they disappear, we disappear. And so I just sort of wanted those, um, those notions of, of, of sharing and kindness to sort of, uh, yeah, be there front and center. That's really beautiful. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think it's really sweet how in the book it's um, on a more, a more immediate level in the sense of everybody in the forest knows how to make bannock, like that's how famous it is. So everybody can help solve this problem of, oh no, I was supposed to deliver this and now I have it. <laughs> like everybody, mm -hmm. it's it seems like all the animals know like, oh, I've messed up something, a chore I was supposed to do. So I can definitely yeah. help with that too. And, and then, I can totally make bannock even though I don't have like, you know, opposable thumbs. Like, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, but I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. The person who asked about um, whether or not this was representing a certain kind of indigenous group of peoples, um, they said, thank you for this bilingual book. And then another question that we had was, and I, I think you kind of answered it, but were you thinking of a specific kid or maybe yourself as a kid when you were thinking of how Owasis would move through the world or we, when you were talking with Amanda, like um, they seem, Owasis is very, uh, to me seems very rolling with it. And I don't know if that speaks to more the reciprocity, but I, I feel like um, I personally would have had, had to have a serious freak out if I had messed up something like that. So I just really like that Oasis is, it seems to be in more harmony with themselves and the world around. And so I was just wondering maybe, were, well, and one of our participants was wondering too, were you thinking of somebody specific or? Uh, not especially. I mean, I have nieces and nephews and things like that. Um, I, I like the the description of Oasis is rolling with it. It <laughs> kind of fits the uh, skater vibe that we had before. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I didn't have anyone in mind in particular. Um, I just had a sort of, uh, it's kind of the hardest part to sort of talk about, uh, about the book just simply because I, I don't, um, I'm not an artist and I, appreciate people who can draw and who can like make things with their hands um you know uh i yeah i i just cobble together words and i'm just like hey you know and i just push them out kind of thing um but um i sort of had an idea in mind as to what the character would look like and um but i couldn't quite articulate it um, and so when Amanda came back with the illustrations, it was, um, it's not like I had anyone in particular in mind, but it also was like, I had a sort of, um, a shape. There was a, there was a figurative shape to what I wanted to be on the page. And, uh, I knew that, that the Oasis that I have here on the left with the sort of hat, you know, off to the side and stuff like that was not it. And so when Amanda came back with these sort of like bright, colorful characters that are sort of, uh, everything's round in the text, you know, in a way, like um, it's not angular. I, yeah, was definitely. Like, I was like, that's um, that's exactly what I was feeling when I wrote the book, right? So 
in, in, in a weird way, even though it's quite visual, at least for me, uh, it was how I felt about it when I saw it. It was, it was all affect, all feeling, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I wish I had a better answer, but no, nope, it's not based off of anyone I know. And it just, uh, yeah, uh, I knew Owasis when I saw Owasis, but I, I didn't know them before then. Yeah, I mean, that's beautiful too, I think. And I think it speaks to writing and what you inspired in Amanda and how you kind of came to that together. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, that's the whole collaborative aspect of it, which is like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably the funnest part, yeah. Yeah, and I would venture to guess it's not something you necessarily do um, yeah, in I academia mean, uh, as much. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I do, I do have some co-authored publications. So uh, if, um, uh, sure, I'll, I, I'll plug myself. Why not? Do uh, it. Yeah, um, I wrote a book with my colleague, Gina Starblanket. It's called Storing Violence. It's, um, I know this is a children's book reading uh, or discussion, but if you uh, want to know anything about the history of colonization uh, in Canada, especially in Western Canada, specifically in the prairies or the plains, um, that's a book that I, I wrote with a friend. And uh, I also have some other uh, uh, publications that I've done with uh, other people. And yeah, I think there's something about the collaborative writing aspect that I, I, I think is, uh, can be quite generative if you um, if you give it the room or space to be, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I think that um, it is, you know, it is a children's book, but language affects us all at any point in our lives. So it is like worth thinking 100%. about. Um, a little bit going back to something you had spoken to a little bit earlier. Um, we have a question about how long did you ponder the idea of the book before you began to start the actual work? So there was the search for Manic and then there was the discussion um, mm -hmm. with your friend and then with Julie and then how long was the entire process? So you talked about coming to Oasis as this illustration with, um, with the illustrator, it took about with Amanda, it took about a year, but how long was everything from the road trip to the first publication? The oh, first yeah, time you yeah, had yeah. it in your hand. Yeah, it was it was years. I mean, and that, um, yeah, I mean, would you get the idea? I mean, everybody gets ideas for particular books they might write one day and things like that. Um, it wasn't until I, was sort of nudged by a few people who were close to me to actually write this thing that I was like, okay, um, I could write it. Um, but the story I told about trying to find Bannock um, and when that event happened and when the actual publication of the book happened, um, I lived in different parts of Canada. Like the, a lot of things happened in my life in between those events in terms of moving across, you know, a vast uh, uh, country and things like that. And so I, I kind of want to say all told, probably something like three years. I mean, if you get an idea and you write it down right away and you find a publisher and you have an illustrator like sort of at the ready, it could take, you know, eight to 12 months maybe, but I didn't know I was going to write a children's book. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know where I was living. It was all of these things all at once. And so uh, I just so happened to be moving to uh, Winnipeg, which, uh, Again, it's a tiny little city in Canada. And uh, I was moving there to be a professor in the Native Studies Department. And as I was moving there, uh, it just so happened that Highwater Press was there as well. And so uh, I found my publisher and all those things, but I had the idea in Vancouver, fleshed it out in Vancouver, and just, uh, I think also wrote it in Vancouver. And so it, it it took not only a lot of time, but I actually moved spatially like across vast distances as well, and you know, all these things. And so um, if you're looking to write a children's book, uh, like I don't think there's a right or wrong uh, answer to this, but just, yeah, if you have uh, 
an idea that you want to see to the end, then I would pursue it. That's what I did. Do you think you'll do it again? Uh, I hope to. Uh, I have a few ideas, um, but uh, and the publisher wants to have a sort of series of Owasis doing, you know, interacting with different things and and uh, because the text is pedagogical too. I mean, the first one is about, you know, you can make Bannock and uh, you can learn some Cree. Um, if I were to do it again, I would, it would be about learning Cree, and, but it would also be about, you know, making something else, right? It's, it's, uh, I wanted to have a sort of, um, I've always thought of the Oasis and all of the stuff as a sort of like a very engaged sort of reading and sort of participation with the text. That would be, so awesome. I would, yeah, we hope, we're excited to see it. We were be waiting. Um, no, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying not to give any spoilers, you know? Yeah, no, no, yeah. definitely. <laughs> um, um, yeah. You can tell me uh, off Zoom, off camera. Um, off but, Zoom, I'll tell you all the spoilers. Okay. <laughs> um, I have another question and then I have the, I have well, we have a question from the chat. How did you okay. decide to make the transition of writing on historical issues to writing a children's book? Um, I mean, the which I mean, it kind of sounds like it isn't as much of a jump necessarily as it might seem, right? Because of language and because of living in this space that is contested space in so many ways. Um, yeah. So they were just curious. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I think a few things. So I'm just a literature scholar and that's what I, I'm an English professor. And so I read a lot of books, whether they're, you know, graphic novels to children's books, to novels, to critical texts and, you know, uh, all of these things. And so I, um, I never really envisioned my in, in, in I never really envisioned myself being a children's book uh, author or, or at least writing a, a children's book. But I am. Um, um, I think I, generally I have a sort of um, there's a sort of promiscuous way in which I'll you know I I read a lot of stuff and I sort of write a lot of different things and I just sort of like go in all these uh, sort of different areas. And I, and I think cultivating a sort of generative um, uh, that in a way that it's, you know, you can sort of navigate between different genres and texts and stuff like that. It, it sort of led me to, um, but I also wanted to get at ideas of, as I said, these sort of deep down Cree ideas of Kotuan and things like that. Um, I, I will also state like as well that like, uh, I think Bannock is a very complicated and contentious term. And uh, I mean, not the term in and of itself, but the idea of it, it has a interesting history. So just to get to the historical aspect of this question um, is uh, yeah, I've, I've had, so um, Bannock for some indigenous people is a sort of a, a sort of a comfort food. It was a food wherein, you know, as colonial forces are moving westward and all, all these things are happening, it's something that's cheap, uh, something you can make very quickly. Um, and yet I think there is a sort of tendency or there's, uh, yeah, this is a long complicated thing to sort of, you know, uh, uh, Articulate, and I almost immediately regret bringing. This no, up, it's fascinating. Okay, Is it so? So uh, I think in the U.S., y'all say usually something like fry bread, right? Yeah. And so you can make bannock and you can fry it, and it's essentially fry bread. But um, there's also uh, there's a way in which people talk about fry bread and bannock, which sort of makes it as though. <laughs> these particular comfort foods for indigenous peoples that they've had to use strategically, historically, you know, as people are sort of advancing into their homelands, um, there's a way in which these foods are framed as, uh, you know, um, as a, uh, well, they're sort of pathologized in a way. So, you know, 
because there might be high tendencies of diabetes or things sure. like that within within our communities, you know, things like that, that, um, that it's because we eat these foods. And so when I wrote, like, I've had conversations about the book afterwards, and it's, it's not a sort of uncritical celebration of foods that might um, affect us in harmful ways. I, I, I personally don't think that I think Bannock has the possibility of doing that, but not necessarily. I think really at times when I think about things like Bannock or fry bread or, fr or, or fry bread, what I'm sort of thinking about is that, you know, uh, at times indigenous peoples are placed in literal food deserts, like we don't actually yeah. have, and they will eradicate our uh, entire economies that we have at work. Like the, yeah. the thing, how we sustain ourselves and how we live and function in these areas. And uh, what will happen after that is they'll build a gas station and say, okay, eat these processed foods, or right. you can make this cheap food that you used to use for survival that provides all this comfort and all these things. Uh, but if anything happens to you, we're going to actually then project that blame directly yes, back certainly. onto you. Yeah, so I, I, um, I, this is a bit of a tangent here, but I just, somebody asked about the historical aspect of Bannock and and trying to write academically uh, while thinking through children's books, I also was uh, cognizant of, uh, or tried to be like, what does it look like? Uh, or, you know, be aware of writing a book about Bannock that can seem celebratory, but also like know the context and history of this particular, you know, food item. And I think what I would say generally is that, um, I think it's fine to eat bannock and especially if, if it's a comfort food and it has been historically, but it's also been a way in which uh, indigenous peoples have avoided things like starvation. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that, um, yeah, I think it's- um, It's a that, form of uh, resistance using tools that you were left with after there was displacement yeah. and <laughs> genocide and colonization of a space. And okay, yeah, I tools just, of resistance are, worthwhile and definitely part of the historical record and definitely important for kids to learn. I mean, these kinds yeah. of conversations are why we wanted to have BIPOC authors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I was sort of couching my language a bit, but no, you please said genocide. Don't. So this is exactly <laughs> what we're talking yeah. about. Um, yeah, no, I think that's wonderful. That's, I'm really glad that we, you know, that's, you were able to say that. I think that's really important. We have a fry bread power uh, comment in the chat. So thank you. Uh, it is delicious. <laughs> I can't wait to try Bannock. I'm definitely going to try the recipe. And if you check out the book, um, there is a recipe in Oasis in the world famous Bannock. And you can check that out on Hoopla using our resources with your SFPL card. So um, there's no wait list and it's at the very back and just really quick we're getting close to time but just on the legs of that last question Dallas if you're gonna have bannock and I know you can put toppings on it do you go sweet or do you go savory what what is your so, uh, uh, I uh, yeah that's probably uh yeah the most important question that's been <laughs> no, I'm just kidding but um yeah, I, I'm personally a savory person. So I like, uh, I would eat bannock with a stew, you know, like hamburger soup, like sort of like uh, just things that I grew up with. Uh, but uh, bannock with like just some jam or jelly, or, you know, and butter is also incredible as well. But I, I usually tend to go on the savory side of things. And they have uh, something which I'm sure you're familiar with being from California. They have things called Indian tacos. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So you get a big <laughs> piece of fry bread and it's just, you know, you're, it's essentially a taco and it's, uh, it, there's nothing, not, nothing can beat that, but it's. They're delicious. Yeah. It's yeah, so good. They are, they are scrumptious. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so, so much for being part of this author series and for participating in our summer stride Dallas it's been really amazing thank you to all of our attendees for their questions for facilitating allowing us to have this conversation we couldn't have done it without your questions we really appreciate your participation um, it's always so exciting to see everybody at their virtual program so yes thank you so much Dallas I'll um, probably email you later but thank you and um, 
just everybody, please join us again next week on Thursday, June 24th for the next uh, installment of our BIPOC Kidlit series with Zeta Elliott, the author of A Place Inside Me, A Poem to Heal the Heart. And as I mentioned, and as the link was dropped next week, also on Thursday, there's the um, live reading, uh, well, me and Dallas reading Oasis in the World Famous Hispanic in the Spanish, English, and Cree. And so that's all for today, everybody. Take care, and we look forward to seeing you soon at any one of our open library locations or at any of these virtual programs. And if you want more information about the San Francisco Public Library branches that are reopening because we know things are changing very quickly, you can visit sfpl.org slash reopening for more information. So thanks again so much, everybody, and have a great Thursday.